So have you ever been reading a Jane Austen novel or watching Pride and Prejudice and you think, wow, men were such gentlemen back in the day. But what does it mean to be a gentleman in the Regency era? That's what we're going to be talking about here today. I've approached this topic from the social status aspect of it and the money aspect. But what we're going to be talking about here today is the behavior and the gold standard of what it meant to be a gentleman in the era and how this has a huge bearing on Mr. Darcy's story arc in Pride and Prejudice. If you'd like to learn all about that, then definitely stay tuned for today's video. Just so that we're all on the same page when we talk about gentlemen, let's talk about the fascinating history of the word gentleman itself. So we have the word gentle plus the word man. That's pretty obvious. However, from our modern understanding of the word gentle, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means free from harshness, docile, soft and delicate. And the question then comes up, okay, we have a gentle man. Does that mean that the Regency idea of a man was someone who was soft and delicate? Was that their masculine ideal? Is that where this word comes from? And the answer is no. The origin of gentleman comes from the word gentle. Gentle comes from the word genie, which is the same word root that we see in words like genealogy and generation. Why? Because it meant to give birth to or beget. And in the word gentle, it specifically meant to be born into a high class family, to be born to nobility, to be born into the gentry, to be born into a family with ancient roots and histories. And we really see that definition holding through with its other cousin words of gentility and genteel, pretty much words depicting living a very high class lifestyle, having high class refined manners, and being the social superior. So most of us are pretty familiar with medieval England and how they had knights who were just so chivalrous and honorable. And basically that's where the upper class in England decided that they were gonna create a code of conduct that they needed to live by, that they needed to uphold. But basically the upper classes were like, we are going to be polite and civilized and courteous. This is the code of conduct that all men of our class need to follow if they want to be a real gentleman. And it had really become the second part of the equation of being a gentleman. You needed to be born into a high enough family and also you needed to follow this gentlemanly code of conduct. Now, what was a true gentleman like according to this code of conduct? Well, he was finished and complete in whom mildness was associated with courage, erudition mollified by refinement, and courtliness dignified by truth. He is a specimen of what the English character is capable of. So yes, that was an incredibly tall order. And in fact, being a gentleman affected every single area of a man's life and we're gonna get more into that in a little bit. But basically this addition of a code of conduct into what it meant to be a gentleman added an interesting layer because it served several different purposes for the upper class. Number one, it gave them legitimacy. So if we think about the upper classes of England, they had a major problem, especially in Jane Austen's time when there were revolutions going on in other places. And this problem was one of legitimacy. So as we've talked about in videos, like what is the British aristocracy? These were the people with the land, the money, and the power. In a massive way, it was highly unequal. And they had not really done anything to earn that other than be born into the right families. Then of being of gentle birth. So by creating this code of conduct, what they were doing is they were creating a reason for their legitimacy. Because if they could convince the rest of the country that gentlemanly conduct was the best, that gentlemen were inherently smarter, more refined, more polished, more courteous, more honorable, more self-sacrificing than any other class of men, well then guess what? Then they deserve to be the power as that be. They deserve the land, they deserve the money, they deserve to rule the entire country, more or less. Now, because they would sell the concept of gentlemanly behavior as the gold standard of behavior, what we 
had then, and in many ways our English language still reflects that today, is this idea that being upper class was the best, right? So all of the lower classes and the middle classes should just constantly strive to reach this gold standard of gentlemanly behavior. They should be courteous or courtly, right? They should be polite or polished. They should be gentle or of high birth. And if they can't actually be of high birth, they should just strive to act like those who are. Guys, they were the original influencers of the entire country and their impact on the English language and how we even view behavior today is still very real. They led such a massive PR campaign that they were the gold standard of behavior that it never really went away. And I think we could look at this as nobody was out there being like, you know what? Low class behavior is the best. We should all be low class. Could we just be more crude and unrefined? And if we even look at those words that were used about the lower class, like unrefined, they were the opposite of refined, which is what the upper class were. I'm not saying that we should all be crude and unrefined, by the way. Please press the like button on this video in a very refined way if you would like to do so. <laughs> but I'm just saying it's really interesting how it is based on this assumption that being like the rich people is the best way to be. And like I talk about in that video on the aristocracy, one of the aspects that they really dominated was the Church of England. And we see that in the gentlemanly code of conduct too. They adopted a lot of Christian ideology as the code of conduct behavior ideology, which in many ways gave a religious flavor to being a gentleman. It was like the righteous thing to do, which also helped add a air of superiority and an air of legitimacy to their rule. They were the moral and religious superiors. And while they wanted their inferiors to develop some of those Christian qualities, they also used the code of gentlemanly conduct to exclude them in order to keep their class safe from social climbers. So as I've talked about in my video on how to marry up and social climb, one of the most important aspects of marrying up and social climbing was adopting the behaviors, the manners, the etiquettes, the even just little things that they did every day. Like for example, where do you put your hat when you're on a social call? That was a small refinement that men born into the upper class knew. They were raised to know this. However, social climbers had to learn it. And in many ways, it would be like trying to go to a different country and join their culture and pretend to be one of them. But there's like a million little things that you don't understand because you were not raised that way. And that you might think you're doing great, but someone from that country could be like, this person's weird. <laughs> like, they're eating that potato wrong. That's not how we eat potatoes here. It really did help them keep their exclusivity. And it created a sense of cohesion and a sort of brotherhood among the upper classes. They were all in on the code of conduct, while those outside were not. Now that we've talked about being a gentleman in society in general, let's talk about in an individual man's life. What did this mean? And let's use Mr. Darcy as an example. But first, here's a word from this video's sponsor. I am obsessed with Brooklinen. So Brooklinen is a luxury sheeting company. However, they also have affordable prices. Look at the cute little bow. Whenever I'm on vacation at a hotel, I miss my Brooklinen sheets back at home. And when I get home, I'm like, it's just so high quality. Anyway, today I got their linen hardcore bundle. And one of my favorite things about their bundles is that you get to mix and match different colors and sizes on their website and build like your own personal aesthetic. They smell really good when they come out of the package. I love their linen because it's 100% linen made in Portugal and it has that like effortlessly chic rumpled look that just like makes me feel very glamorous. I really wanted to let you know about them too right now because they're having a sale. They're having their Labor Day sale with 20% off all of their stuff through September 6th and you know as we head into fall is the perfect time to upgrade your bedding. Thanks so much sponsorship Ellie. Let's talk about Mr. Darcy and the identity of being a gentleman. 
So I think in the modern era, when we think of someone being a gentleman, it's usually because they just did something that's like, oh, he opened the car door for his girlfriend. He's such a gentleman. But then we don't really think about it again for a while, right? Like we're not like, he's such a gentleman as he picks up that fork. He's such a gentleman as he walks across the room. He's such a gentleman as he reads that book. However, that really is how it was in the Regency era. Every single aspect of a man's life needed to be gentle, aka high class and refined. But how did they get there? Well, it all started with how they were raised. So let's look at Mr. Darcy for a second. With that two-part equation of being a gentleman, of being high-born, and of living up to the code of conduct, he has had a part A of being high-born since, well, he was conceived. He was born into a gentry family. He's a major landowner. His mother descends from nobility, his father from an ancient line. If you would like to learn more about Darcy's background, watch my video about why Mr. Darcy is not a lord. Interesting stuff going on there. Basically, Mr. Darcy definitely meets the first qualification of being high born. However, what about the second qualification of having this code of conduct? Well, that is where his parents' job kicks in. They need to breed him well. In fact, that takes us to the term well-bred and good breeding. These are both terms we see a lot in Jane Austen's work. In fact, when Jane is talking about having met Mr. Bingley for the first time, she says, he is just what a young man ought to be, said she. Sensible, good-humored, lively. I never saw such happy manners. So much ease with such perfect good breeding. So here we see all of these traits that of course a gentleman should have, ideal gentleman time here, but also perfect good breeding. That is usually why he has these traits. Meanwhile, with Mr. Darcy, his manners, though well-bred, were not inviting. So even though Mr. Darcy was not the most inviting guy, he still got the well-bred marker. Pretty much being well-bred meant that you were raised the right way by your parents, that they sufficiently taught you how to live up to this gentlemanly code of conduct. And this is one of the very first traits Jane Austen usually notes about new characters in her books, how their breeding turned out. Was it good breeding? Were they well-bred or were they ungentlemanly? So say you're now a parent of little baby Fitzwilliam. How do you make sure to breed him well? Well, you would want to A, set the right example. So many different aspects of gentlemanly behavior could be learned from example. For example, what tone of voice do you use? What tone of voice do you speak to the servants in? How generous are you to the poor? All of these aspects are going to be absorbed by your children, of course. And then there's the reading and the education. He would have read a lot of classics. And of course, these classics would have reinforced the idea that the aristocracy was the best and they had the right to rule. And then of course, there'd be other vital lessons, like for example, bringing a dance master in to teach him how to properly bow, to teach him how to dance, to teach him graceful elegance. Also, penmanship. Of course, we all know that scene where <laughs> Carolyn Bingley is over there like, wow, your lines are so straight, Mr. Darcy, you write so well. She was not exaggerating. Men were expected to have good penmanship, which, okay, can I just say, whatever happened to that? When I was in school and somebody would turn in their paper without their name on it, the teacher would sit at the front of the class and be like, hey, someone forgot to put their name on their paper. I can't really read the writing, so it's probably a guy. The teachers all did that all the time and it created this expectation that a guy's writing would be ugly <laughs> and unreadable. And I'm like, Mr. Darcy had great penmanship. What happened to this? This needs to come back. This is a total side note. Of course, other areas would be like proper courtesy to women and the elderly, being encouraging to children, how to have a sparkling conversation and really talk about things of depth as well. All of these areas are different areas a gentleman would need to excel in and that they would learn partly from observation in their families and partly through formal education. However, one of the biggest areas of education, the most important to writers like Jane Austen and to clergymen, was the moral guidance. They needed to instill in their sons self-sacrifice, honor, kindness. They needed all of these qualities but 
the problem in the Regency and the other areas was often that was the part of the education that parents skipped. They would make great show gentlemen like Willoughby's and Wickham's where they are charming and they have the air and they can dance well and they can converse on all these topics. However, when it comes down to their true moral core, they're not that great of guys. And this takes us to Mr. Darcy and the question of, is Mr. Darcy really a gentleman? Like for real, not just a show gentleman, but deep in his soul. Let's talk about his story arc now. So if we look at Mr. Darcy's story arc in Pride and Prejudice, most people are familiar with it. He's very prideful at the beginning and then Elizabeth humbles him and then he transforms into a better guy. But is that really what happens? Does he change because he likes Elizabeth? Or is there a deeper reason for Darcy's transformation? Well, let's look at this story here and discover if there is. So let's imagine that we are Mr. Darcy at Rosings preparing to go and propose to Elizabeth Bennet for the first time. We look in the mirror and we're like, yeah, we look good, we're tall, we have the cool outfit on, I look very much the true gentleman. I'm so gentlemanly, she'll definitely accept me. Now, we need to pause for a second and ask ourselves, how important was being a gentleman to Mr. Darcy? So how much was being a gentleman part of Mr. Darcy's core identity? Well, a lot. In fact, if you think about it, from his very birth, the only thing he really ever needed to be was a gentleman. A gentleman of property, a gentleman of standing, a gentleman landlord, his life was being a gentleman. His earliest education, the way he sat, the way he danced, the way he even went to church was all affected by this identity of, I'm a gentleman. When people met Mr. Darcy, he knew one of the first questions they would be asking themselves is, is he well-bred? Is he a gentleman? It was an all-encompassing life identity. And that's what Mr. Darcy had when he set out to propose to Elizabeth Bennet. And then what does Elizabeth Bennet do? Well, she crushes his entire reality. Let's look at his proposal scene. So I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the scene of proposal. Well, Mr. Darcy's like, you must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. And then Lizzie's like, no, you broke up Jane and Bingley. And then you did this to Mr. Wickham. I'm not marrying you. What's so fascinating is through all of that, Mr. Darcy has his pride intact. Like he is upset at Lizzie for turning him down. He's upset at Lizzie for saying all this stuff, but he still thinks he's awesome. And he pretty much lets her know. It's like, my faults according to this calculation are heavy indeed, but perhaps these offenses might've been overlooked had not your pride been hurt by my honest confession of the scruples that had long prevented my forming any serious design. These bitter accusations might have been suppressed had I, with greater policy, concealed my struggles and flattered you into the belief of my being impelled by unqualified, unalloyed inclination, by reason, by reflection, by everything. But disguise of every sort is my abhorrence. Nor am I ashamed of the feelings I related. They were natural and just. So even though she just totally turned him down and said all this stuff, he's still like, I think you're the prideful one here. I was just being honest and not flattering. He still thought he had the moral high ground. And I think that's just so fascinating because it's at this moment, at this very moment that Mr. Darcy's life is about to change forever and how Elizabeth Bennet responds to him. She says, you are mistaken, Mr. Darcy if you suppose that the mode of your declaration affected me in any other way than as it spared the concern which I might have felt in refusing you had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. This is like Elizabeth Bennet's mic drop moment. She just essentially said, you did not behave like a true gentleman. You're not a true gentleman. And it's this moment that actually affects him emotionally. It says, she saw him start at this, but he said nothing. The first time in this whole scene where he has nothing to say, really. And she continues, you could not have made the offer of your hand in any possible way that would have tempted me to accept it. 
Again, his astonishment was obvious, and he looked at her with an expression of mingled incredulity and mortification. The guy is finally mortified. And then it says, she went on, from the very beginning, from the first moment, I may almost say, of my acquaintance with you, your manners, impressing me with the fullest belief of your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain of the feelings of others were such as to form the groundwork of disapprobation on which succeeding events have built so immovable a dislike. So Lizzie makes this accusation, you're not a true gentleman, and then she backs it up with what you're lacking, Mr. Darcy, is that deep moral grounding your parents were supposed to give you. You're selfish, you're conceited, you don't care about other people. That is what Elizabeth just said to Mr. Darcy. Now, how does Mr. Darcy react to that? Well, first of all, he leaves. He goes and he writes an impassioned letter defending himself against the Wickham charges. But he also does deep self-reflection. In my video, How Not to Marry Mr. Wickham, I've talked before about how Jane Austen's characters in their story arc, they usually have a moment of self-realization where they realize that they've been partial or blind. We see Elizabeth Bennet have that one after she gets the letter from Darcy. We see Emma Woodhouse have it. Catherine Moreland has it. They all have this moment, but nobody really ever talks about Darcy's moment and this is his moment. This is the moment when he has to look at himself and is like, my entire identity of being a gentleman was just called into question. And the more I think about it, the more I realize she's right. In fact, Darcy admits later when he proposes and is accepted by Lizzie later in the story that it is this moment that changed his life. He says, your reproof so well applied I shall never forget. Had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner, those were your words. You know not. You can scarcely conceive how they have tortured me. And so being tortured by this realization that he needs to do some serious personal work, he starts asking himself, like, why am I like this? And he comes up with the fact that as a child, I was taught what was right, but I was not taught to correct my temper. I was spoiled by my parents who, though good themselves, allowed, encouraged, almost taught me to be selfish and overbearing, to care for none beyond my own family circle, to think meanly of all the rest of the world." So Mr. Darcy acknowledges that the problem goes all the way back to how he was bred. His parents did not instill in him the humility and all of those other traits that they were supposed to. Now they did a pretty good job because he's a loving brother, he's a kind landlord. However, they overlooked some major aspects and this is the same realization over in Mansfield Park. Sir Thomas has at the end of the book about where he went wrong in raising his children. He says he feared that principle, active principle had been wanting. They had never been properly taught to govern their inclinations and tempers by that sense of duty which can alone suffice. And really this is a topic Jane Austen looks at quite often, which is the problem with the parental example and the breeding leading into problems in gentlehood later in life. So after Mr. Darcy has this realization, what does he do with that information? Well, he changes. And I think that's an interesting thing is Jane Austen's female leads do the same thing when they have these sort of realizations. They grow and they change. That is a hallmark of Jane Austen's sort of good characters. Meanwhile, her bad characters only usually go from bad to worse, such as Wickham, Willoughby, Mr. Elliot. Her good characters have problems, but then they learn from it and they grow as people. And that is what Mr. Darcy does. Now, I think we also need to talk about this issue of where Mr. Darcy's motivation for change is coming from. So if we look at him versus say, Henry Crawford in Mansfield Park, who also wants to change because a woman did not accept his marriage proposal, namely Fanny. What is the difference between the two of them? Well, their sources of motivation are different. Obviously, the fact they're both in love with the women who turned them down has had a major effect on them. However, Darcy has a deeper reason for wanting to change. He has the intrinsic or internal motivation of wanting to be a true gentleman. Again, remember that was something core to his identity and that just got called in question. That statement is what hurts him the most and he wants to be a true gentleman and he wants to be a true gentleman whether Elizabeth ever accepts him or not. 
Meanwhile, Henry Crawford just wants to change so Fanny will marry him. That's it. He doesn't really see the deficiencies within himself. He doesn't see the need for change. And we definitely see when Fanny's not around, he doesn't do that great at continuing to change while Mr. Darcy does all of this hard work. And he never actually even goes back to Longbourn and is like, hey, Lizzie, look, I made all these changes. Want to marry me now? No, remember, Lizzie has to show up at his house and it's upon suddenly her showing up that he's like, oh, oh, she's here. She's here. <laughs> like, and then he can show her these changes he's made. And in fact, the book says that for the first half hour, he just wanted to show her that he was capable of those changes. And then after that half hour, he was like, wait, maybe she'll marry me now. <laughs> but basically the main difference between the two is Darcy has an internal motivation for change that is independent of Elizabeth and that is core to his identity. And Henry Crawford just wants to marry Fanny, which is kind of, I think, why that doesn't work out in the long term. But basically to sum all of this up, what does it mean to be a true Regency gentleman? Well, first of all, It'd be great if you were high born. And then also you needed to have the code of conduct. And this code of conduct included everything, the way you sat, stood, walked. In fact, even in Emma, Mr. Knightley only has to take a few steps across the dance floor. And she's like, wow, he walks just like a gentleman. So you gotta take a few steps like a gentleman. And there are so many different aspects, but the most important, and I think the most important to Jane Austen, was the qualities of the heart, of being honorable, of being humble, of being kind, of being self-sacrificing. Those were the real qualities that a gentleman needed, and so few of them actually had back in the day. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you think you would try to be a true gentleman or lady if you lived back then? Would you be like, I want to be all refined and polished and polite? These are the questions. And also, yes, remember that Brook Linden is having their sale. It's their Labor Day sale through September 6th with 20% off on their website. I will link to it below. And also, I have a discount code just in case you miss the sale, but like you're thinking about sheets later. I will also put that below. And keep being awesome because you are awesome. Bye!